This episode of the AD History Podcast is brought to you by listeners like you, contributing through the crowdfunding platform Patreon. Learn more about how you can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash adhistorypodcast and the exclusive benefits that await your generous support. Join us in the effort to keep creating the AD history you deserve by visiting patreon.com slash adhistorypodcast. Thank you. Have you ever wondered if Commodus is really as crazy as a certain movie makes him out to be? Or if anyone has ever tried to compile the four Gospels into one? Well, have we got a story for you. This is the AD History Podcast, weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD. Powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo and I am joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. What's the good word, my friend? Uh, The good word is everything, really. Things are going good at the moment. Happy to be here. I mean, the world isn't in too good of a state right now, I suppose, but I'm happy Hope, you got, hope you're happy too, basically. To quote David Bowie, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all okay. Uh, Paul, I believe it's not just us two today, though, however. No, no, no. We have a special returning guest. And I'm happy to reintroduce TGNR's editor and chief and founder, better known as our boss, Kristen E. Struberg. And we're bringing her back in today because... Once again, if you're familiar with the Caligula episode that was in about the middle of season one, a little about a year ago now, I think it came out. Uh, She joined us one is because in this case, we're talking about a rather notorious figure in Rome by the name of Commodus. And if you've watched Gladiator at any point, you know how Joaquin Phoenix did that. But in any case, his whole persona and character has taken on a very interesting characterization in history. And we're bringing her in to help us kind of navigate through exactly who he was, how much truth there is to it, and the best way to kind of look at what we're really dealing with. So she obviously has graduate level education in neuroscience, in addition to working in clinical pharmacological research, and she's absolutely perfect for coming back here today. Kristen, thank you for joining us again. Thank you very much. Thank you again for having me on. I'm delighted to be here again. And um, let's have another case study. And before we jump into it, let's lay down our necessary, obligatory, now legendary AD History Podcast Ground Rules. What? Evaluate events in the context they occurred. Two, over the span of recorded history, The way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it 50 years ago. 3. Nothing in history was inevitable. And 4. History and the past is like a different country. So, Paul, you have a fascinating uh, subject for us today, and... For the last few episodes or so, for for a big chunk now, it seems like we've been in the realm of the five good emperors. And they have been. I mean, we've questioned their goodness to some degree at points in the past, but on the whole, things have been good. People have been nice. These emperors have been good people, more or less. I'm bored of that, Paul. I want that to change. I want a really nasty piece of work to talk about. Have you got anything that could fit that need? I think I can give you something that may very well fit that need in spades, my interesting friend. (laughs) And that is the one known as Commodus, or Emperor Commodus, who was the sole surviving heir of one Marcus Aurelius, who in historical circles generally needs no introduction. But the thing about Commodus is is that he gets wrapped up, and we'll figure out if this is justified or not, we'll see, with figures like Caligula, like Nero, like Domitian. And we talked a good deal about Caligula and Domitian on this podcast. And in some ways, based on the records that were written and various histories, especially 
at that time in which he lived, where he's very much characterized to embody the worst of all three. And personally, that to me is extremely interesting and an incredible historical puzzle. So I think it is best to set the scene. It is 180 AD, and Marcus Aurelius is on campaign. He's dealing with the troubles with the northern tribes that are happening in Germania, and uh, something it's an issue in terms of foreign policy, not just there, but in Parthia as well, but especially with the northern Germanic tribes that very much hampered the entirety of his rule. And he very much was hands-on in terms of being with the army to figure that out. And when he died, he did not die due to strangulation by his son, but in all likelihood due to the horrific scourge that we talked about last time, Patrick, the Antonine Plague. And he was only in his late 50s at the time that it happened. Yes, for many historians, this demarcates the end of the so-called five good emperors. It also demarcates the end of the so-called Pax Romana. This is interesting because this particular scene is very much one that is in many people's minds, specifically the one where Marcus Aurelius is effectively choked to death in one form or another by his son and presumptive heir. This most certainly did not happen. Marcus Aurelius was probably closest to about modern-day Vienna at the time. He very likely died of the plague, and his son was nowhere nearby. There was no succession struggle that was going on. There was no some grand plan to revert the empire back to the republic where the senate and the people held the power. That is outright bollocks, to say the least. <laughs> he was not worried about his son coming to power. And do you know why, guys? Because his son was already in power. Back in 176, in the case of Commodus, he became co-emperor with his father, Marcus Aurelius. And there was some precedent for this because Lucius Verus, prior to his death, very likely from Antonine Plague, had been in that role with Marcus prior to this. And in that case, it kind of worked out because Lucius Verus wasn't that interested in the business of ruling, and it definitely went to the more capable ruler. And for Commodus, this is an interesting situation. One, because in so many ways from very early on, Commodus was absolutely trained and reared and raised in every way you can imagine, education with tutors, experience in politics, all of that from a young age, knowing full well that this was to be his role upon his father's death. Now, nobody could have known when that might have happened, grant you, but Marcus Aurelius had no plans on making this grand democratic rebirth. That's just Ridley Scott having some <laughs> artistic fun. Marcus Aurelius did have a very good relationship with the Senate, but there was no intimation of him saying, I'm giving Rome back to the Senate, and him leaving this as some sort of quest for Russell Crowe's character, Maximus, to complete because he doesn't trust his son to do so. That's just nonsense. There's, there's absolutely no question about it, and you're 100% correct about that. But in the case of Commodus, like for example, in addition to all the rearing and upbringing that was involved in getting him ready for this, I believe he first became a consul, like somewhere between ages 14 and 16. 16. 16 years old. This at one time was one of the most powerful positions in the entire Roman government. Now, granted, it didn't have quite the same amount of power by any means in the imperial system. But if you're 16 years old, think of it this way. If you are in the United States and you're 16 years old in high school, you're thinking about your junior prom. He's <laughs> literally sitting there at the right hand of the ship of state and the one who is steering it. 
He was also shortly thereafter made the co-emperor. He actually married fairly early on at about 16 as well to establish better dynastic ties, which for a Roman male of his station was pretty young. And all of this was just the reality of which he lived. But he also had an additional incredible challenge, which of course is living under and then ruling after the incredible legacy that was left by his father, who was most certainly extremely appreciated at the time, and his character and characterization has only risen in stature through the times that have passed for those who have been writing those histories. Speaking of Gladiator, just look at the way that Ridley Scott portrays Marcus Aurelius, despite the fact he looks far, far too old in that character. <laughs> he looks easily 20 years older than he would have when he actually died. I don't know. War is a, war is a, a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely should have rewatched Gladiator before I, before we recorded this. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's okay. Well, in any case, it's it's so reverential. You know, he looks like the classic philosopher king that Plato talked about in the Republic. Yes, he does. And it really speaks to just incredibly how his legacy has been carried on through history. So he has to deal with all of that. And my, my goodness, dealing with all of that. And of course, like Kristen mentioned, he is in a situation where the Senate also very much likes his father because his father took a lot of consideration with the Senate. I mean, he never abdicated his imperial role by any means, but he, he was far more inclusive and he was not one for self-aggrandizement. He was rather selfless. And when you put the rest of it together, which I think is awfully interesting for all intents and purposes, my interesting friends. It is one of those things where he was also, like I said, not much for self-aggrandizement. There, there's a lot to admire about the man, and there's really no no two ways of getting around that. And Kristen, let me just ask your opinion. This is this is a human look at it. Imagine being Commodus and and being in that situation at the death of his father, where this really revered emperor, the last of the five good ones is gone, and now you truly have to try and fill his shoes. Traditionally, I feel people break one of two ways. When you have a, a larger-than-life parent, the child typically will go one of two ways. They will either find themselves challenged to live that same life to try and exceed, and they will either do so or try to do so and fail miserably, or they will retreat and say, I can never be that way and will live a completely opposite life of that parent. And obviously it's a continuum. There are many cases in between, but to some degree or the other, the child will break one of two ways. And I think we can see which way our friend Commodus seemed to have break, but we'll also see that it's not quite so simple. No, it's certainly not. And really to understand Commodus' situation, you have to little understand a little bit more about Marcus Aurelius personally. So he has this incredible legacy and reputation for being this philosopher king, and it's not unfounded. And one of the reasons undoubtedly that he is so revered in the way that he is has so much to do with what we know today as the meditations, which is basically an interesting look at his inner life as a Roman emperor, which in and of itself is unique and fascinating because we have so little of actual written words by emperors, right? This is a special thing. And it really has been a document that informs a lot of the modern understanding regarding Stoicism. And Marcus Aurelius really took that to the hilt. I mean, he redefined it. He lived it. He was interested in the mind over matter, as it were, and that one through rationality can overcome their external difficulties. You know, for a Roman emperor, he basically lived as an ascetic, really just like this ultimate minimalist, despite the fact that as a Roman emperor, he had the ability to live with an absolute opulence, which is incredible stuff. 
we've heard in the past about how emperors decided to show off their power of like gold palaces, massive gold statues. So it is quite alarming to hear of an emperor living so minimally is just something that came to mind when you were sharing that information. Oh boy. And we're going to get all and more what you just mentioned mm. here with <laughs> Commodus. And undoubtedly, he's the head of the household. So Commodus is not going to really escape this influence growing up. No, I mean, I he definitely would see that this asceticism, you would imagine, would have influenced his childhood, that he would have been prescribed this type of livelihood in what he was taught, in the way he was brought up. So one can see that this influence may be him rebelling against that in his later life, choices in his later life, which we will unfold here shortly. When it comes to Commodus and coming into power, he's coming out from under his father's shadow. He's basically been raised in such a way. And then he has full power at about 180 at roughly 19 years old. Wow. Wow, mm. to, to, to really be the guy at 19. And of course, this is the issue, right? When it comes to effectively hereditary dynastic rule is that just because the progenitor of the current ruler was extremely capable and good at it is no guarantee that their prescribed offspring that is supposed to fill that role after them, no matter how well prepared they may have been in advance, not just being able to do it capably, but be able to do it well, or even be able to do it at all. That's a very dangerous thing, especially because Rome is in very dangerous times. It takes 15 years, as you mentioned, Patrick, to emerge from the Antonine Plague. So it's interesting um, comparing this to Caligula. We kind of very very softly fell on the side of nurture when it came to the nature nurture question it seems like maybe commodus were almost coming down on the nature side that he was born just not fit for the role at this point in our discussion i just kind of wanted to loop it back to our discussion about caligula but we'll see where we come down on that nature nurture theme as we continue to go along in this discussion so when we begin talking about commodus and the, the relevant history to the, how we're taking this discussion today something to bear in mind is the actual historical sources we're using and it's a combination of three of them really you have uh, herodian who's an interesting history but not the biggest influence for us. And that's the same that goes with the history of Augusta, which is a bit more salacious. But the, the fellow that we're actually most focusing on is Cassius Dio. We've seen this before with Rome, right? Where you have these senators that also become these historians and, you know, they like creating these grandiose works. In the case of Cassius Dio, he kind of puts the rest of them into shame because in the case of Cassius Dio, he actually writes a, a history called history of Rome that stretches back 1,400 years, comprised of 80 volumes. It took effectively a decade of writing and apparently 22 years of actual research. And this God. would also, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. And this would also, of course, include his own time where he was present. So when he's talking about folks like Marcus Aurelius or he's talking about somebody like Commodus, He's talking about it from firsthand experience. And more to the point, since he is a senator in all of this, he also has a vested personal stake. So he goes from something that is largely more or less more scholarly research and history of Rome to a point where it starts very much getting colored by opinion from being a firsthand contemporaneous source for the events that he's recounting to the reader. And he did not have a very high opinion of Commodus. He had a very high opinion of Marcus Aurelius. For Commodus, it was just never going to happen in regards to Commodus. And Kristen, you are extremely well read in history. Think about how when somebody is writing a history that's also contemporaneous, actually has a vested interest in those events, and how it ends up really coloring what it is they're writing and how that affects posterity. It affects posterity immensely. 
it can change the view of how we interpret our history later on. And that interpretation can end up being flawed because of that, because we're only seeing it through one point of view. And what's worse, it's, you know, hardly ever the point of view of the person or the group that is being analyzed. So when you only have that single input of data and you have nothing to compare it with, if you will, it, it skews the conclusion. It certainly does. And so when we're looking back at Commodus, well, of course, you can never discount these sources naturally. We have to understand that there are definitely some folks in this who have a very low personal opinion based on actually dealing with them. So when Commodus comes to power at 19 years old, one thing that is immediately clear is that for the most part, he's not all that interested in ruling. However, despite the fact that in the way he's characterized, especially by Cassius Dio, is that he basically abandons everything that was going on in regards to the Germanic tribes in the north. And that's actually inaccurate. In fact, Commodus did come on the scene and he did bring it to a conclusion of sorts, but not any sort of long-term one. Basically, at least in the way it's portrayed, he gets it to a point where it's well enough and he basically kind of comes to a truce, if you were to describe it in any way in particular, and kind of leaves it at that. The one thing that his father most certainly would have wanted to do at that point and was trying to do, of course, at the end of a sword, based on everything that was going on, is finding a long-term settlement eventually, right? And Commodus doesn't have any interest in this. And when Commodus eventually comes back to Rome, he is, once again, not that interested in the day-to-day, hard-nosed reality of ruling. And of course, this is a problem because you have all this power vested in a single individual. And if for some reason that individual is somehow unwilling or unable the whole system is going to run into some serious issues very, very quickly. There's no question about this. That's mm-hmm. one of the true issues that come with this kind of system. And what he ends up doing is he eventually comes into a situation where he finds trusted personal proxies to kind of do the day-to-day stuff. It's very similar in a lot of ways, though not fully by a proxy, like what happened with Tiberius, right, where he was dealing with... Rome, he gets sick of the place and he runs off to Capri, and which is funny because in our last episode we talked about Capri. <laughs> and from there, he's ruling by proxy and just kind of removed because he hates the Senate, he hates Rome, and he wants nothing to do with it, and he just kind of wants to indulge himself. To a degree, this is what happens with Commodus. He finds a couple of intermediaries to kind of handle his business. There's one that goes by the name of Perenus, who is somebody who's actually, interestingly enough, kind of trusted by the Senate because he's noted for being not terribly ambitious, which is to say that he can be trusted. He's incorruptible and he's good at his job, but he doesn't last forever, specifically when there was an uprising in Britannia that was looking to put their general in charge. And once that general basically rebukes the idea, They send down a detachment of javelins to Rome, and they're confronted by Commodus. And then basically it gets thrown on Perenus, who ends up getting executed. But the problem thing with Perenus was he was actually a pretty good fit given the situation, but it's still not a realistically good one. On top of that, he also has one other right hand that's far more scandalous, a freedman by the name of Cleander. And in this case, Friedman in this case is either the son of a slave or a former slave themselves. And he's very much a an all-purpose hatchet man, if you will, for Commodus. This is an issue, guys, because as we know, especially when you start getting into the upper crust of Roman society, they get really, really tetchy about upward mobility. The idea that there could be a former slave that has the ear, cooperation, and confidence of a sitting emperor is almost profane. Of course, it would have been a big issue, especially as I sort of talked about with the Antonine Plague, with so many people being wiped out. 
slaves were sort of being depended on more because you just needed butts in seats to an extent so that's a very fine point yeah cleander yeah no just think i imagine cleander probably wasn't the only instance of a, of a former slave or son of a former slave uh rising to prominence i imagine it was something that was going on across the empire from what we from what we know from you last time that was something that was becoming a bit at least in roman terms disturbingly common Exactly. And this always happens. Like when something starts happening more and more at the norm, it starts to anger people. So it could have just been another issue of that. It's hard to dismiss that possibility, to be mm. sure. But we also haven't really seen something like this since the days of the Julio Claudians, where they're allowing this kind of access in this kind of way, mm. where the lower rungs of Roman society are allowed in the door and they are not happy about it. But for Commodus, it is not the end of the world until a few years into his reign when a assassination plot is hatched against him from actually, interestingly enough, I believe his sister that also ended up including her husband and one other fellow who, in her case, she was upset that she had gone effectively from, in the days of Marcus Aurelius and early in Commodus' rule, the empress to just a princess in the palace, not having that same influence, having much to do, of course, with, in the case of Commodus, I believe it is either with his wife or, or one of his very intimately close courtiers, if you will. And once this happens, this sets off the paranoia for Commodus, big time, guys, where he already has kind of an ambivalent relationship with the Senate. And as we mentioned, the feeling is mutual. And we start getting accounts, though, interestingly enough, not for specific reasons that are written in the histories of Commodus starting to kill senators and replace them with his own people. This is a very disturbing thing. But Dio actually does make an interesting point in all of this, Kristen. Mm -hmm. I definitely want your input here, mm -hmm. which is that when he was characterizing his face-to-face -face interactions with Commodus, that he basically seemed to not so subtly intimate that he was very easily manipulated and led by more dynamic personalities. He was somebody that could be guided without too much pushback, if you will. So he was always very susceptible to manipulation. And I'm curious how you think that kind of disposition might be a huge factor in terms of where Commodus goes from here. Well, a person who has that type of personality, someone who is, if you will, easily influenced, kind of grabs on to the last idea that's being proposed, I can definitely see how that would feed into his paranoia if that is, you know, if he's being constantly fed these ideas of conspiracy against him having one you know near successful assassination conspiracy take place i could definitely see that feeding into this general paranoia that he takes and takes out on the senate i can also see that if he's around a lot of yes men how that can feed into his period of megalomania as it's been kind of titled in various works this kind of era of megalomania that he enters later into his reign. The highway to hell has an express lane lined with yes men, mm -hmm. to say the least. And that's definitely a very dangerous aspect of what goes on here. But as the paranoia gets ramped up, as the issues with the Senate get worse, even when he's in, you know, entrenching his own yes men, that's when we start getting into the abjectly strange behavior. He didn't necessarily start there, but he's getting there. But as a note, it's not unprecedented behavior what he was doing in the Senate. Not that it was a good behavior, but it was an unprecedented. It was not unprecedented to dig up these wild um, accusations of treason and seizing the you know seizing the assets of these rich senators to refill the coffers. Not uh -huh. a good practice, but not a new practice. Yeah, that that definitely would be one to stick in the craw because. They were having some financial problems, and, and of course, in order to, to keep things rolling, they would most certainly go after those with the treason charges and then take everything. That's enough to piss people off. That pissed me off. I don't know about you, Patrick, 
but um tree you know trumped up treason charges and then hey got to take all mm. your stuff <laughs> yeah that annoyed me yeah to say the least it's a, a, that's yeah. a little irritating at least under stalin you didn't actually own anything exactly uh, <laughs> can't be sold if you don't own anything well i guess it wasn't really mine in the first place so you guys exactly. can take it yes 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 indeed so this is where we start getting into the abjectly strange in terms of something that is very much termed his megalomania. We've used examples of this in the past, you know, like in the case of Domitian, he was really interested in renovating buildings and then dedicating them after himself, as opposed to the person who actually commissioned the building to begin with. We have seen large examples of statuary being put up all over the place to aggrandize an emperor. We've seen just bizarre behaviors like in the case of Caligula, his whole issue in the story about declaring war on the sea and <laughs> having them pick up seashells and return to Rome. And we're going to start going through some of these examples here. And some of them get to the point where you have to wonder, what the hell is going on? It's either, either Commodus, the people who are writing these histories, or some combination of both. So let's get into some of Commodus' more interesting demonstrations of megalomania. And this is all mo mostly according to Dio. He proposed ro renaming Rome itself to Commodiana. And this could potentially be interpreted as wanting to wipe out Rome's already vaunted and legendary history. He wishes to begin referring to the legions in general as Commodian. And that the day in which these two previous measures were voted in as a day noted as Commodiana. And he also, interestingly enough, and this is where we start getting into some really thin ice as far as Roman taboos are concerned. He added the name Hercules to his already gargantuan <laughs> name. And there were many statues that were commissioned depicting him with Hercules and even as Hercules. If you guys are at all familiar with the legend of Hercules. I've seen the Disney film. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> in, the, as a kid. <laughs> in, the, in the case of the legend of Hercules, he eventually, he goes from being effectively mortal to becoming a god. And there's some definite subtext to this in terms of Commodus going and aligning himself so closely, which is at the very least this idea that I may have been born man, maybe. <laughs> and I am ascending into my grand immortality as an all-powerful, all-knowing, kind of benevolent deity. And he's still alive. Yeah. And also by aligning himself with Hercules, he is also aligning himself as being descended from Jupiter and therefore kind of severing his uh, true paternity with Marcus Aurelius, or at least distancing his real paternity from Marcus Aurelius. So, And that's an interesting point to zoom in on here. Mm -hmm. Does this at all speak in regards to his personal feelings in regards to basically having to succeed his father or not? Could it be interpreted in that way, potentially? I think it does speak to that. As I mentioned earlier in, the, in this section of the program, I feel that children of great parents tend to break one of two ways. They either try to follow, follow and succeed, and follow and fail, or they break the opposite way. And I feel this is him breaking the opposite way. Um, I feel this is him distancing himself from his father instead of trying to draw closer and emulate. This is him saying, I don't want to be you either because I don't like you or I feel I can't be you. I was about to ask about that. Um, which is a, a very strong motivator is the feeling I can't be you either because they, they think they can't or they have tried and failed. So finding this new paternity through Jupiter and Hercules is clearly something he feels he can aspire to, can become. It's establishing a new paternal paradigm for himself that he feels he can achieve some very ancient daddy issues basically going on here exactly yeah <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, brother. Okay, well, this gets even funnier from here. So when he's not stylizing Rome, referring to it specifically as Commodiana, he, he wants it also to be referred to as the immortal fortunate colony of the whole earth. And when we call it a colony, that's a little bit of an issue, guys, because that would suggest that Rome is not quite as special as we thought it was that the grand power is coming from somewhere else, but literally, literally referring to it as the immortal fortunate colony of the whole earth. We're getting into some nutty territory here. Mm. I mean, I understand that these histories are, are colored in some way, but man, this is really bizarre. Anyway, he had a thousand pound pure gold statue commissioned depicting Commodus with a, a bull and a cow. <laughs> He proposed renaming all the months of the calendar <laughs> after his many honorific names he gave himself. So this is basically the calendar as I understand it. Amazonius, Invictus, Felix, Pius, Lucius, Iolus, Aurelius, Commodus, Augustus, Herculeus, Romanus, X, Supertorius. 12 months. <laughs> yeah. 12 months. Yeah. And it's not like we haven't named months after emperors before, but I don't think any of them, even ones that really earned it, would Julius Caesar have proposed this? I don't, I don't think so. Would Augustus have proposed this? You know, they'll take a month. That, that's a pretty good thing. But all 12? Bit much. Yeah. And if memory serves, I think... I don't think July and August were named by their... I might be wrong in this. I don't think they were named by their em, the people they're named after. I think they were named in honor yeah, no, of you're those right. emperors. Yeah, you're, you're, believe, you're absolutely yeah. correct. And I believe Antoninus Pius had been offered to rename September after him, but declined, which is very Antoninus Pius, to say the least. Hmm. And this is fun. This next one is fun, guys. Every time he wrote a letter to the Senate, or the Senate had to write a letter to him. This is how it was headed. To the Emperor Caesar, Lucius, Iolus, Aurelius, Commodus, Augustus, Pius, Felix, Armaticus, Germanicus, Maximus, Britannicus, Pacifier of the Whole Earth, Invincible, the Roman Hercules, Pontifex Maximus, <laughs> Holder of the Tribune Authority for the 18th time, Imperator for the 8th time, Consul for the seventh time, father of his country, to consuls, praetors, tribunes, and the fortunate Comodian <laughs> Senate. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Bizarre. There's like I should have so... brought my stopwatch. <laughs> yeah. The Comodian Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. <laughs> there's like there's a couple pro wrestlers I know of who are heels, bad guys, yeah, and yes. like they they have they insist that the ring announcer like list of all their accomplishments before a match as like a bad guy tactic to seem like bad guys annoying is literally like from a pro wrestling book. Like it, it just reminds me of that, <laughs> just to point out how bizarre this guy is. It's just the whole Commodian Senate thing is mm. <laughs> killing me. And, and why is it killing you, Paul? Because it's like it's almost like he's saying, "I address you, legislator of the bathroom." <laughs> to literal toilet humor. Yeah, yeah. that's what we're yeah. that's what we're reduced that's to. That, that's what we've been reduced here, thanks to Commodus. <laughs> I blame him. Everybody else's. Oh goodness! And then, of course, of course, he he wanted to, a measure to pass that would be refer officially referring to his rule as the golden age in all official records, and quote, without exception. And then, of course, he also wanted to put his head on the Colossus statue of Nero that was near the Colosseum, which is funny to say the least. <laughs> which is something we've also talked about in the past about, sorry to just, just bust in, we've talked about in the past them um, heads being changed on statues is just another example of that. Yeah, just thought I'd put that in there. Yeah, the, oh, it, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. New so, emperor, new statue. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I got to just remove the tears from my eyes real quick. That was too funny. <laughs> and anyway, this is some pretty intense stuff, especially for a guy who literally inherited power. But I do have a question. Mm. So we know these. this is a hostile source. Yeah. So my question is, what's the hard evidence that any of this got implicated? 
Well, basically a lot of the corroborating sources in terms of hard evidence suggesting this kind of level of self-aggrandizement, especially like with Hercules, we have the statutory, public statutory right, right. evidence. Right, we have the statutory for the Hercules. And we also have a lot of coins that have been found that have you know, made these references. But outside of that, we're, as far as I know, in terms of like the super hard evidence, mm -hmm. we're basically you know, have to go on the, the credibility of whether it be Cassius Dio or the history of Augusta or Herodian. So that, that that's where it makes things a little problematic. Right. But it, because this is so over the top mm -hmm. that if you were to take it at face value, you would indeed be asking, what the hell is going on here? Because you could almost say like the whole renaming the months of a year as a joke taken the wrong way. Quite, quite possibly, like the whole thing with, mm. with with Caligula and saying he wanted to make his horse consul. You know, like, you know, I'm so powerful, I could rename the weeks of the month after myself. Quite and possibly, but I think these were actual measures to be voted on. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think these were actual measures to be voted on, if I, if I, my, my research here is correct. Okay. So, but this wasn't even a little more credible then. Yeah, but this wasn't even the thing that was the the most vile. Okay, give us the most vile. Mm -hmm. In many cases, the most vile. The one that is most vile, and the one thing that most people are familiar with, is Commodus and his relationship to gladiatorial games. Oh, yeah, and in the case of gladiatorial games, Rome has a very kind of bizarre relationship when it comes to gladiators because gladiators are effectively the bottom rung of society and yet in their time at their various heights as individual gladiators they're also revered they're celebrated but they'll never be able regardless of that to really rise above their station in the case of the games as we'll just call them the games the gladiatorial mm -hmm. games marcus aurelius didn't have the same fascination but his son did and in the case of his son, it, you're kind of in a strange position here because if he competes in whatever means he competes, and he competed a lot, to what extent can we really trust the outcome? Because as a gladiator, despite the fact that they're supposed to not fear death, going to go and try to take his head off, I have a little trouble believing that. So he is, in fact, actually a very good sportsman. That's, that's mentioned. He's a very good sportsman. And he's quite adept at these things. He's trained all his life. But the big problem is, more than anything, on the fundamental level, we'll get to the other aspects in a moment, is the fact that he's consorting with this lowest rung of society again. And he's not doing it just in the privacy of his own quarters in his own palace where he's out of sight of the public. He's doing it in front of a huge crowd in a quite literally gargantuan world of famous now amphitheater that we know is the Colosseum with thousands of spectators. That's their emperor down there. And despite the fact that we're also supposed to revere gladiators, we also know they're never going to rise above their station. And when he's doing this, it's considered extremely inappropriate in the extreme, right? And we've had other emperors that have performed in some way before. You know, Nero's known for the theater in particular, right? Mm. And in this case, that consorting is, is just so shunned upon. And he was really one of those things where he did a lot of different things. Well, first off, there were a lot of displays of him killing exotic animals, uh, animals that were not, of course, indigenous to the Italian peninsula or Rome that you'd have to bring in, elephants or tigers, it was all of that. According to this, he killed up to 100 bears, a tiger, five hippos, and then two elephants, and that was in consecutive days. <sighs> and then things like camels, horses, all of these sort of giraffes. And apparently, if, if, if the accounts are true, he did actually very skillfully, like in some cases, doing it with one shot with like a bow and arrow type thing. So he knew what he was doing, but it was just this needless slaughter, <laughs> even in a time and place that really, really got off on that kind of stuff. And yes, he did fight other gladiators. I can't help but think it's interesting because this is clearly a guy who enjoys a fight. You know, enjoyed using his sword, his shield, his bow and arrow. Why didn't he do that on campaigns? If he was an emperor 
who enjoyed this. He could have like led the armies, you know, actually been there. And that would have changed our depiction of him greatly if he was this emperor who joined his fellow soldiers, his centurions in battle, because he clearly enjoyed a battle and a fight. But instead he didn't. He chose to do it amongst gladiators, amongst people much lower than him. It just, it depicts him in a very interesting role. Because I was thinking like, surely the people would have loved an emperor who fought alongside his men. But this is, it's such a different kind of fighting. It was just something I thought was interesting. No, it is a very interesting contrast that you have a personally martial um, emperor who doesn't go out and do, you know, feats of martial prowess with his soldiers. And I think that part of that is a a clash with, you know, his father's greatness, that he feels he can't live up to that, that he felt he couldn't repeat what his father did, even though his father, while very popular among the troops, was himself not a martial man. He was considered, you know, kind of weak. Paul, anything to add? Well, you know, that's the thing, is that the question I have is, Patrick, first off, that is a, a friggin' excellent question, <laughs> if I may say so myself. I'm curious, though, your interpretation of the fact that it has to happen not just in front of the public, in the Colosseum. But on top of that, he would basically make it so that the entire Senate had to attend as well, and they couldn't get out of it. And I'm curious because naturally, if you're out on campaign and you fight well and you lead well and you put all of these skills together in a way that would actually further Rome's strategic interests, how is that so different in this case, in your opinion, Kristen, from the fawning affection of a Coliseum crowd. Well, he clearly wanted the love of the people more than the love of the soldiers. And that's kind of the thing I was wondering about is because he's obviously a show off mm. and he seems to love a crowd and that the end is more about the crowd than necessarily using those skills in a, well, a far more productive way. Yeah, yeah that's a good enough. way to put it. As emperor. So all of this really just rankles with the Senate. The Senate is obviously the upper crust of society. You know, you, you have your, your senatorial class, as it were, and they have a very specific way that they think they should be going about business. But the question I'm going to pose here is, what did the Roman people make of all of this? So there are two things that need to be kind of rehashed here. So we go a little bit back and, and we talk about the death of Paranus and, you know, the large contingent of javelins that were sent all the way from Britannia that led to Paranus's death. And obviously the Roman public were not oblivious to this. They saw what was going on and when it happened and there began to generate a, a general feeling that, OK, we, we really need the emperor to be the emperor now. And when it came to these demonstrations and shows put on at the Colosseum, while the Senate was extremely dismayed, and we know why, in terms of what the Roman people felt, and this is interesting, they were definitely entertained by it, but they were also subsequently and simultaneously put off by it. Because in the case of an emperor, guys, especially in a one-man rule system, this is a problem because they want their emperor to be the freaking emperor. He's not there just to entertain them. I mean, we know about bread and circuses when it comes to Rome. But even that's a step too far for, for most Romans, who do have expectations of their leaders to know what to do and how to behave. This really puts us in a situation where, based on all of these things taken in amalgam, it's not exactly a shock, even colored as these histories may be, that we're beginning to see basically questions of not just his fitness to rule, but his sanity outright. I don't know if we would I would question his sanity, but I would definitely question his judgment. You can question someone's judgment for a long time without questioning his ability to be in touch with reality. Let me ask you this question. Let me toss it back. Yeah. Isn't mm. judgment a reflection of one's own mental health? It is a reflection, but I would say there's a, several degrees of judgment before you start questioning someone's sanity. What are those? When they start making judgments that are deliberately harmful to themselves, 
deliberately harmful towards others or ones that just have no basis in logic or in no way tethered to reality. Like getting a box that contains an egg and a feather being sent by someone who has bipolar disorder and is in a manic state. That's not being tethered to reality. So, so you really do believe here this is more a matter of somebody who's just exercising extremely poor judgment as opposed to somebody who's not really tethered to reality? I do. I think this is someone who is probably saying, I'm going to do this, and there's no one to say, hey, man, tone it down a bit. Tone it down. <laughs> yes. And I do wonder, honestly, and guys, we know that when you're going back and you're looking at historical figures— that it's extremely difficult to be able to come to these kind of conclusions because you're not just dealing with the historical figure. You're also dealing with, naturally, those who are writing the histories, the context in which is happening, specifically the cultural expectations. Because so often we find, and this is certainly the case back when we were talking about Caligula, that based on Roman societal expectations— these kind of behaviors could have been questioned as less than mentally balanced. Is, is that a fair assessment, Kristen? Yes, this can be seen as being less than questioned, uh, could be seen as less than mentally balanced, but this is not what a Roman emperor does. No, this is not what a Roman emperor does. But my understanding is it's not as taboo as, say, when Caligula made himself a living god. Let's go a little further afield than even just the, the gladiator demonstrations, which are odd enough. Yes. When we're talking about Roman emperors and being deities, we know now, because it's been going on for such a long time, that upon many emperors' deaths, they're, they're officially made by the Senate to be considered as gods. And it's usually a reflection of how popular a given emperor is at the time of their death. And it can also be rescinded. It can also be added back on later. All of these things. Mm -hmm. But like Caligula, he was beginning to get onto that thin ice. Yes. And this is something that's extremely well established and that Commodus would have known. How does that figure into the equation? To me, this is the more worrisome behavior than the going in and fighting his gladiator. I mean, that's, that's wild. That's inappropriate. But this is a social taboo, like a big taboo that applies to everybody. This is not just a mismatch of, of social stature. This is violating custom, culture, religious practice. So you're breaking a lot of a different strata of cultural applications. I know they also found have found coins where he equates himself with Helios, so another way of deification while still alive. So to me, that is the more disconcerting aspect of his behavior is him so seriously taking himself as, you know, the mortal becoming immortal in the playing of Hercules, the assuming the co-identity of Hercules in his everyday life. That really does kind of hit at the center of it. Mm -hmm. From what I can tell, the rest of it seems to be all a matter of poor judgment, despite the fact Marcus Aurelius did everything possible to make sure that was never the case. Yeah, but naturally. when you start making in no uncertain terms, I am the living God, we begin running into trouble. Yes. Mm. And this is the kind of the amazing thing. So a lot of times, like you say, he's getting bunched in with all the other derelict emperors, and they're all derelict for different reasons. They all are also very much into self-aggrandizement, as we know. The thing that's amazing, though, unlike, say, a Caligula, is that Commodus manages to eke out a rule for 12 years, whereas in the case of Caligula, it's not even four, which I really do find interesting. Either he was a bit more competent than we give him credit for, or the other powers that be were far more tolerant. I'd be very curious to know why there wasn't more aggressive action taken in that case, because this guy has been really, really just chafing at the other power brokers in Rome like no one's business. 
And amazingly, like I said, he gets there for about 12 years, but he does end up getting assassinated. He does end up getting assassinated. It was a three-person plot. One of them included, in fact, um, his mistress, who was lower born. It's also on the same level as Cleander in terms of stature in society, so she can't really be seen in public, and apparently she's quite unhappy with this. And I believe there was another courtier involved. And they ended up poisoning him, and when that started to fail, they then proceeded to have his wrestling partner and trainer suffocate him in a headlock. I find it interesting that his wrestler's name was Narcissus. <laughs> mm-hmm. nah, oh, that bites. Yeah. That Literally bites. Literally killed by his own narcissism. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well put, Patrick. Absolutely poetic. That and apparently within Roman society too, being strangled to death is not a glorious or in any way dignified way to die. Naturally, when he died, the Senate came together and passed a uh, damnato memoriae, which upon his death, the Senate decreed that Commodus' name would be wiped out from all public <laughs> places, including removing much of his public statuary and either remove completely or alter to no longer resemble him. They're still at it. They're still at trying to wipe these guys out from history when they die in in an unpopular fashion. This has literally become part of the political process in a formalized fashion. And that kind of backs up Cassius Dio's claims that he wasn't a good, a good, good bloke because even the Senate after his death agreed to remove his statues in his name, I guess. So if if you want to argue, oh, that's just Cassius Dio being overdramatic because he didn't like him, there's just more evidence to back up that Commodus wasn't a good bloke. <laughs> Especially when it's a Senate that he largely packed himself. Mm. I mean, doesn't that say really say it all? Yeah. Like I said to you before we started recording, I haven't watched Gladiator in quite some time so i didn't have joaquin phoenix's portrayal of him sort of baked into my brain so i very much captured my own image of the guy it's an interesting watch it's very much historical fiction emphasize mm. the fiction part all in bold letters the thing i'm curious about here while we have Kristen, when you're looking at commodus from the psychological perspective and you're trying to put all of these ingredients together let's compare him to the other fellow that you've weighed in on the past which, of course, is Caligula. And what do you see being the critical differences between these two? Again, we have very little direct evidence from the patient in question. This is going to be a sketch, very broad sketch. But cool. with Caligula, you had a lot of, we felt a lot of external influences on him that made him into who he was and a lot of repression when he was young, you know, gave way to excesses when he was older. When I look at Commodus, I see someone who is much more reactionary, someone who is, reacts more extremely to his surroundings, to his upbringing, to his family history that we, you know, know a little bit more of simply because we, we know more about Marcus Aurelius he is someone who kind of wanted to reject who his father was and who his father wanted him to be and went the other way. And I think he also tread a very familiar path to power when power is given instead of earned. He has been surrounded by a bunch of, you know, courtiers that are just yes men and no one's there to say that's not a very good idea, or maybe we should do this something different. And his whims are just indulged. And so the whims get more and more extreme, and no one's there to rein him back. There's a big difference, though, I think right now, at least in the big picture, regarding Commodus relative to, say, Caligula. Mm -hmm. Right now, as far as where we are in the late second century, this is a far more dangerous time for Rome. You need somebody at the wheel that really is on board and and really understands what's happening. So I'm a little surprised that they were as tolerant as they were about this. And Rome is about to come into some very, very difficult times, specifically in regards to some third century crises and quite a revolving door of emperors. They've been weakened by the Antonian plague. They're still dealing with disturbances with 
Germanic tribes in the north. And not everything has played out quite yet in the Middle East. So for Rome, in the big picture, there could not be a worse time for any of this going on. Better the danger you know than the danger you don't know. Amen. And we'd like to thank you again for joining us, Kristen. We really appreciate your insights and having you on. And this is your operation. You are Queen Bee, so you can join us anytime. But we really appreciate when you do come on and share some of your truly singular insights on things that we're just not capable of. So thank mm. you so much for sitting here with us today. Yes, thank you very much. As Paul sort of Paul pretty much said everything I want to cover there, but you do bring an insight, that sort of psychological neuroscience insight that we simply cannot bring to the table. So always great having you on and getting you to dissect some of history's more interesting characters. Thank you, guys. It's been a lot of fun today. This is the AD History Podcast. Okay, now we are here for our middle segment for our Patreon submitted question segment. And remember, if you donate to the AD History Podcast on the $5 tier per month or higher, one of your many benefits is to be able to submit a question for the middle segment here that Patrick and I can answer. And it can be about pretty much anything, anything in history, anything that we've covered in history, anything that has to do with the show or Patrick and my professional life, that's all in bounds. And today we actually have a really interesting one because this is a question I feel like I get asked a fair amount anyway. And this is from Emily on Patreon who writes, what all is entailed in creating an episode? It's a really interesting question. I don't think it's one we've yeah. ever talked to the audience about before. No. So a look behind the scenes of how AD history gets made. So Paul, I, obviously I don't want to give this question entirely to you, but it has to be said, obviously I'm unfortunately, I've got my handful of a firstborn. I got to deal with most of the time, but putting it lightly. So Paul, you do amazing stuff behind the scenes with AD history. The show wouldn't be what it is with the effort Paul puts in behind the scenes to make it possible i i just that that needs to be be said of course i do i i research my own stuff and whatnot but you are very much the tech side of this show and i'm thankful and the listener base i'm sure are thankful for that as well that praise is something that will keep me warm on a cold <laughs> winter night patrick thank you i really appreciate that um yeah i i do i am primarily the the tactical side of 80 history, but it's not all technical, of course. It, naturally, we're we're making decisions in terms of what we want to cover, how mm. we want to cover it, what makes it in, what won't make it in, or eventually we'll cover in what we missed. And those are difficult things. And it takes time to be able to research these episodes and and take an angle on them where you as the listener start at a point in which you may not be as familiar and by the end, have a much stronger grasp on what it is we're sharing in detail and, and why we've decided to share it. Yeah, uh, and that is where the episodes begin. The episodes do begin, I guess, even before you begin researching, it begins with a topic we've decided on. Sometimes sometimes we have a good clue as to what topic we're going to be doing in any given year. Like Sometimes it's sort of carry over from the previous episode. Sometimes we have no clue. I've gone into an episode not knowing anything about what to cover much like what i'm about to cover for this episode i hadn't heard of this before i started researching for this podcast so it really is kind of like just dig diving in seeing what we can find happened at any at any given period of history really and luckily so far we've been pretty lucky in finding great stuff for every decade so far oh absolutely and of course there's all the stuff that goes into finding guests coordinating all of that fun stuff mm. Uh, in terms of the technical side of things, the one thing I want to preface this with, guys, because undoubtedly there are more than a few of you listening, wherever you may be listening, that especially with all the lockdowns and whatnot going on, we're home more. And you've probably asked yourself, well, how how do I do what they're doing? How do I create a podcast? And what I want to preface this by saying is that if you think you can do a podcast, then do it. Mm. Do it, whether it be solo whether it be co-hosted, whether it be something else entirely, there's no better time in history right now to be creating this kind of thing for a number of reasons. So I always encourage people to do it. The other thing I'm going to mention is that when I talk about how Patrick and I do it, do not come to the conclusion that you need to go to this length. Patrick and I are professionals. We have a certain expectation for how we want it to sound and how we want to do it but it isn't necessary to take it to this extent. 
and hopefully we'll give you a little bit better of an eye. So this gives you an idea to how we do it. And if in the future you're all curious how you can do it on a somewhat smaller scale, but effective, we're willing to answer that as well. But in terms of how we do it, the secret sauce basically starts from here. First off, obviously, we're both on a computer in two different places. Uh, I believe we're all we're all using Mac. On my side, I have a Mac yeah. Pro and a, one of the new Mac M1 Minis, which has been fantastic. I think you have an iMac, Patrick. Yes, yeah, I've got an iMac here. And the way we end up sounding so clear, like we're in the same room, is due to a free online program that you can use through a Chrome browser called Source Connect Now, where it captures this really good, clear audio of us in two different places because it doesn't have echo rejection or any sort of sound treatment that you would get on something like Skype, where they're trying to filter out a whole bunch of stuff. Something what is so good about Source Connect Now, and I feel it's probably a mistake probably a lot of people do when they go into a podcast firsthand is we record this podcast on both ends. So even in the, if the internet quality is poor, it's actually like recording our raw audio on both our computers. Then we match those together in software. Cause I think a lot of people, when they record podcasts, they record it from one source and you get one person who sounds great. And the other person sounds like they're speaking through a tin can and that's just like that. That's yeah. like with Skype, you're only recording one end of it and getting like this dodgy internet version of audio coming through for the other person, especially if you're doing a podcast like us, like a lot of people are doing, I imagine, at the moment in two different parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And in our case, as Patrick mentioned, we have a couple of backup recordings. So you can record locally on both sides with Source Connect now, which is excellent. Then you download it later. They say there's a time limit. We've never run into it. No. Um, on Patrick's side, he's putting together a backup recording on Audacity. On my side, I have actually both of us going on two different tracks with a bunch of real-time audio plugins. We use compression and noise gate limiter, that kind of thing. It's not so important to get into that. And have so backups. we have it. Yeah, no, that's yeah. where the main one is happening. But we also have backups. In addition to the fact, we also record on my side into a completely separate device called a digital audio recorder, uh, the Zoom H5. Um, in, in terms of things you guys probably are more thinking about, though, is what kind of microphones are we using? And this is something I really, really want to emphasize, guys. 99 out of 100 articles you read about what you need to do to start a podcast are going to tell you the kind of mic that you want is a condenser mic. Every single one of those is pretty much wrong because a condenser mic is far too sensitive for you guys. What you're looking for is what Patrick and I are using, whether it be as a USB or or as through an XLR setup, a dynamic microphone, because it captures far less of the room around you. And we're not living in anechoic chambers, guys. You know, we're not living in literal padded walls for sound treatment. So definitely go with a dynamic mic. And in our case, I use, I just switch out a couple of different mics. Right now I'm using the Electro Voice RE320. It's a brilliant mic. Earlier, Kristen was using the other mic that we have, which is the one you've all seen so many times, which is the Shure SM7B, most notably used by Joe Rogan, in addition to many others. It's a very kind of like status symbol mic in the creator world right now, but it's an excellent mic. They're both a little pricey, but you can definitely find good dynamic mics that are far more affordable. Uh, and Patrick says you're using the Rode Podcaster, right, uh, Patrick? Yeah, the uh, Rode Pod mic. Yeah, Rode. Group, yeah, Rode. From Rode your Pod recommendation, mic. yeah. Before this, it, I was using the classic Blue Yeti. Yeah, and that was a condenser mic. Uh, but right now, with these two dynamics, it works out really, really well. We record in the case of Patrick, and he's using a Mackie eight-channel mixer, the 802 VLZ4, which is an analog, which you need for an XLR setup. In our case, I'm recording and recording with Patrick into the Soundcraft Signature 12 MTK, which is a multi-track mixing recorder. And we record live into Logic Pro 10, which is truly excellent stuff. Obviously, you also need a good set of closed back headphones, so that way the sound is not bleeding from your headphones, from your partner or yourself into the mic. Rather important stuff. And as far as the editing side of it is concerned, uh, for the most part, we have been using Adobe Audition on my side, which is a very, very good program, a little bit more advanced. You know, I think a good place to start where I started is learning on Audacity and just kind of graduating to that because you can really learn a lot. And now we've transitioned over to Logic Pro 10, which is a 
another thing entirely. And in addition to that, we use a, a piece of software that very few of you are familiar with. And even if you start podcasting, you'll probably never have to run into called Isotope RX-7 Standard, which is basically just, for the sake of a better word, black magic. And I think that covers all the tech side. But like, as Paul said, you don't need to be as meticulous as no. us. I mean, just got, if you've got a decent mic, and I'd say the one, one thing I would stress is record on both ends and just put it yeah. together afterwards, because that is, I think that's so important. And But that's not the only part. I think the other part people would be, be curious about, Paul, mm. is how, how to even end up on your phone. Because like, obviously, I come from the YouTube world where you just click a button and it ends up on YouTube. But podcasting isn't anywhere near as simple as that. And like you said, once again, technical side, you do have a lot more of that sort of end than I do. Well, basically, something I think most people are familiar with is that when it comes to podcasting, it's mostly done through the RSS feed, which without giving a horribly technical definition, is a, a feed from the site in which the show is based that is sent out via the RSS feed for that site. It's a very old piece of technology that's been given new life through podcasting. And all of the episodes are actually hosted on our podcast hosting service, Blueberry, that we place into the article that serves as the point of origin for the RSS feed that goes out to play places like Apple and Spotify or wherever service you may be listening to. And then, of course, we're also available on YouTube as well. But that's a different thing where you have to upload entirely. Yes, and Blueberry is a paid for service. So a lot of podcasts actually have, it's unlike YouTube, which I didn't know is you have to pay. There are free versions. We have to pay to have your podcasts hosted on those platforms. And you guys are paying for our podcast host uh, for our podcast hosting via Patreon. Thanks to your support on Patreon. That is covering our podcast host this episode. You're able to listen to this thanks to your support on there. I just thought that was a really fitting way to wrap this up. And if you guys want to help support the channel in a really meaningful way, like making sure it stays online for you to enjoy, then Patreon really is the way to do it. There'll be a link to our Patreon down below. And not only does it help uh, support the show, literally support the show by keeping it online, it helps uh, us in so many other ways. And it gets you loads of extra goodies like early episodes. And of course, getting to our, getting us to answer one of your questions like this at the $5 mark. There'll be a link to our Patreon down below. Yes, absolutely. But if we're going to leave you off on one thing, guys, this is it. Because the way I interpret that question is a patron who's curious about doing it themselves. And that's very simple. Do it. Do it now. Don't don't even think about it. I, I was having a conversation briefly with a colleague of ours when I asked him, had you ever thought of doing a podcast or a YouTube channel? And they said to me, well, you know, I always thought about doing X, Y, Z, but I'm not sure that I would be good at it. And the thing I told him was very simple, very straightforward. I have had the pleasure of knowing quite a few very successful YouTube creators or podcasters, my beloved co-host <laughs> being one of them. And it's been my experience that every single one of them, when they first, before they first decided that this was what they were going to do, said that and asked that very same thing. And the fact of the matter is everybody has a creative voice. Everybody has something in them that they want to uniquely share with the world, and there's no better time to do it. So you podcast, will listen. The world needs more good, interesting voices. And if you want to do it and you think you can, or you're just curious if you can, do it. Do it now. Do it without any abandon whatsoever. It is its own reward. So long as the reward is the hard work and satisfaction you get from it. Everything from there will follow. Couldn't have put it better myself, Paul. And like you said, a lot of people ask themselves, what if I'm not good at it? I still ask myself that every day with YouTube. <laughs> it's the world that we live in, my friend. It's the, it's the life that we've embraced. If I can do it, if Paul can do it, then definitely you guys can do it too. Yes. And of course, the one thing I remember Patrick telling me before we leave off this segment that I really love, I always remember it, is if that one person thinks something's interesting, if one person thinks something is funny, then there's a million other people out there somewhere who do as well, and it's the challenge to find them. But if one makes it possible, then there's an entire audience. You just have to find them. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Patrick. And we'll be back <laughs> right welcome. after a word from Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast, 
Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at ADHistoryPC and the hashtag ADHistory. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. Also, check out the AD History Podcast on Patreon. See how you can help support the show and the rewards that await you by exploring the AD History Podcast on Patreon. See the link in the description. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. Now, Patrick, we're going into a, I would say, a supplementary and very interesting piece of history that very much fits into that prolonged discussion we had regarding not just the Gospels, but creating a New Testament canon. And that is a wonderful place to take us today. And all I can say to that is, as I so often do, Mr. Foot, Sir Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you, Paul. So, yes, as you mentioned, a few episodes ago, we devoted our entire show to catching up with Christianity. And a big part of that is we looked into the Gospels and who actually wrote them and how the New Testament started to form. And we also asked ourselves the question, why are there four canonical Gospels? Like the same story being told in different ways, different parts added and removed four different times. It just... It, 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 when you hear it like that, it's quite strange. And wouldn't it be easy if there was just one gospel and just one narrative on the life of Jesus to follow? Yeah, you know, go the Quran route. Yeah, exactly. And that'll come into play soon enough, Paul. Well, once upon a time, someone did try to do just that. And for a spell of time, um, a part of Christianity had just one gospel. And this wasn't, they didn't choose okay, we're going to choose Matthew and follow just Matthew, or we're going to follow just Luke. Some guy, some guy, a certain person compiled all four Gospels into one story, one definitive narrative. And this was done by a man called Tatian, and his Gospel compilation, as known as his compilation of the Gospels, is known as the Diatessaron. So we first need to ask who was Tatian, and we don't know too much about him as it's so often with these people, but he was Assyrian, which is obviously most associated with modern day Syria, hence Assyrian. And he sort of claimed himself, he was born in the frontier district between the Roman Empire and Parthia. And what we know is he studied mythology, history and poetry, very sort of the creative liberal arts, I guess, as we would call them um, in this day and age. And he grew jaded at the Roman religion. He wasn't a fan of uh, paganism, as I believe Roman uh, the Roman religion is considered a, a pagan religion. And eventually he travelled from uh, Assyria to Rome, and he actually studied under Justin Martyr, one of the main Christian philosophers and a big figure in shaping modern Christianity. And he was known for a lot of things. He was known for his fiery temperature. This is uh, Tatian, by the way, not Justin. He, T- uh, Tatian was known for his fiery temperature, and he was quite a controversial figure at the time. And there were a couple of reasons why he was so considered so strange. First of all, he was an abstainer. Abstinence was, of course, considered a very odd thing. But that wasn't the strangest thing he did, especially to the Romans. Not only did he abstain, he was also... A vegetarian. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and just to add to that, he drank water instead right. of wine. This is as rebellious and we're, you know, they're alien concepts to Roman society, not wanting to drink wine, but drinking water instead. It's just something I found really uh, enjoyable when I found out about this guy. And this uh, Tatian was disliked by many, but that didn't stop him from doing the most famous thing he is known for, the thing he is primarily the only thing he is known for throughout history. And that was compiling the four Gospels into one book. As I said, he didn't like the Roman religion. He sort of followed, he went to Christianity and he thought, I'm going to have a crack at this. And what was the diatessaron might be the good question here. And it actually comes from Greek, that name. And it means harmony of four. And as mentioned, it's simply the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, John and Luke compiled into one read. 
and it's thought to have been published around 170 AD, hence why we're talking about it now. Though I've seen other sources point to actually being earlier, being to about 150 AD, but either way its impact lasted into this decade and beyond, so it's good to talk about it now. Why did he choose these four Gospels? That's a really good question, Paul, and it's one I didn't actually find an answer to in my research. And I was sort of rereading my notes just then, I was like, oh, that's handy, it was those ones. I imagine towards this time in Christianity, these four were probably becoming the top billing, even though there are many other Gospels out there. As we mentioned with uh, Macy, and he kind of made his own Gospel. I think by this time in history, it was these four that were being chosen as the main ones, the ones to recite from. They're the ones in circulation, which we'll come back to in a moment. And there were a few theories as to why we think Tatian compiled the four Gospels into one. It's, so this is what I found interesting. It's believed Tatian studied from people who would never actually have read the Gospel and only heard it out loud. Gospels, even, I ought to say. Only heard these Gospels out loud. And you can imagine, imagine hearing four different retellings of the same story in different ways without there being a written source for that you're gonna be confused like i heard him say it that once time i heard him say it like that the other way but there's no written proof of this and that that's bound to confuse people so naturally it, naturally people would have just had these sort of four different ways compile into one basic story in their mind there are also earlier compilations of the gospels the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were actually compiled in Greek in years previous. So this wasn't new territory Tatian was following here. Though it's thought the main reason Tatian compiled the Diatessaron was to create a clear, consistent narrative for early Christians to understand more easily. It can get confusing, like even today, it can get confusing why there are four different versions of this story in the Bible. And Tatian thought that's what I just wanted. We just want one narrative that we can all enjoy and understand and as mentioned these four gospels circulated across churches independently not as a collection so one part of christianity might only have luke another part might only have mark one might have just matthew and john gets confusing and the diatessaron brought these all together and how was it compiled you might be asking yourself and Titian followed the words of the gospel and he made sure all the key elements stayed in, though he actually removed duplicates. He only wanted to keep one of each story to keep the narrative clear and concise. So a great example of this is the feeding of the 5,000. That's mentioned in a couple of the Gospels. So I don't know which one he kept exactly, but he got rid of all the other ones as Jesus only feeds the 5,000 one time during the Diatessaron because it's meant to be a streamlined approach to it. And he also, what was another clever thing he did, he removed uh, the elements of the gospel that contradict one another. So in case one said this, but another said this, get rid of them. There's only one. Like I said, this was all about consistency. And the diatessaron ended up being about three quarters of the size of all four gospels put together. So smaller, but definitely not awful, like not much smaller in the grand scheme of things. I read that it included all but 56 verses of the four Gospels. So it wasn't, he didn't hack at it too much. Only 56 verses of all four Gospels didn't make the cut. But it was definitely a convenient package, for sure. Like, people really took it up. And the Diatessaron, to begin with, was a huge success. It actually became something of the de facto gospel to read, especially in the Syrian church. I read it last until about the 5th century, in the Syrian church, Syrian Christian church, it was until about the 5th century the Diatessaron was their go-to holy books. And other branches of the church used it too, including the likes of uh, Catholicism used it, uh, Judaic Christians and even missionaries, they would go with the Diatessaron. And St. Arrhenius, who was a key figure in Christianity, he actually declared the Diatessaron as the main authority on Christianity. He was like, this is the go-to book. This is... This is what we obey now. And so for some time, it was a hugely successful version of the Bible. Unlike Macy's Bible we talked about earlier, this one really did prosper for some time, though it wasn't perfect. And some stuff about the, uh, the Diatessaron 
actually came to light and it turned out Tishan added some material to it. He added extra scenarios to it. Like he said that a beam of light shone from the River Jordan as Jesus was baptized. And adding to the Gospels like this is a huge no-no. Those texts are sacred. Imagine someone adding extra details to the Bible now. It would be shocking. We don't. You know, we obey those words because that's how they're written. It was a huge no-no to add to the gospel, and it found, and it was revealed Tatian was doing it, and it wasn't even in big ways. Like I said, just just a little embellishment here and there. So by the fifth century, it started to fall out of fashion with church leaders, and it, it couldn't have helped that Tatian himself wasn't that beloved of a person. They're probably quite happy to get rid of it, and Tatian was, of course, dubbed a heretic for his actions for adding to the church for adding to the Gospels, for putting his own imprint in them. And this is when we step out of the historic fact into my historic ideas. And we want to ask, why why didn't this last so well, Paul? I'm sure you have a reason for on this as well. Why didn't the Diatessaron stick about? It seems like a logical thing to have just one narrative. And it seems one narrative is probably the key issue of all of this. A lot of uh, Christianity is about how the Bible and its writings can be interpreted. A lot of people read into the Bible and read into those words and find solace in them by by figuring out how they can be used to benefit, to, I don't know if benefits the correct word, how they can find solace in those words. And giving us multiple multiple gospels, telling us different things about the same situations and interpreting uh, the acts of God and the teaching of Jesus in different ways gives us more room to interpret those actions to benefit our own lives and to understand our own world more clearly. And having just one narrative explaining this is exactly how something happened and this is exactly why it happened just gives us less possibility to interpret. I think people wanted these things told to them in other ways. And I think, I personally think that's a key reason as to why the Diatessaron fell out of fashion. Paul, do you agree with me on that? My guess is they wanted more. They definitely wanted more. But I look at this and I look at his approach, and obviously I think the New Testament's composed of, I think, 27 books in total. Mm. So it's obviously a great deal more than the four Gospels. But the thing I take away from this that I think is really interesting, one is it just so happens that he chose the four that exist today, right? He chose the four that exist today, and I find that really, really very compelling. The other thing that I love, and this is something you see even today with all sorts of stuff, like especially when this is not comparing a religion to an entertainment franchise, not that at all, but the concept is similar, which is you get certain franchises like, say, Star Wars or Star Trek, and you have really hardcore fans, and they really, really despise breaks or interruptions or contradictions in continuity. That's such a good parallel. Yeah, it's almost like like, you could argue that Tatian did this out of passion. He wanted there to be one. Yeah, I understand. It's like when Disney wiped out the sort of books. Oh, they wiped out the EU and and turned them into legends. Yeah, that was a crime. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it's stuff like that. No, it's a really good um, way of putting it. Sorry, carry on. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that was that yeah. was definitely a crime because there's some good mm. stuff out there in Legends. Yeah. But so I find it interesting that he has such an interest in continuity, and and that's also has a definitive biblical context and implication because there are definitely times in the Bible where when you read it, and this is true for a lot of people, they 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 identify contradiction and they don't like it and it creates problems. And so I find that really fascinating. The other thing that's interesting is the fact that Tatian ended up getting dubbed a heretic. And maybe this is just my evaluation of it. And certainly not everybody is deemed a heretic for the same reason. But it seems like most of the people that make the biggest splash tend to end up getting called a heretic. (laughs) Yeah, it does seem like that, doesn't it? Like often, more often than not, the ones who really try and shake the ground i guess you really try and get things changed the ones who are considered like crazy and that's something we still see to this day like the amount of like you can read so much stuff about like people who really change like pioneers in things and at first they're called like this is stupid what are you trying to do and then 
they turn out to be the victors. I mean, it's not always the case, but yeah, you're right. A lot of people who try and go against the flow. Yeah. Or add something to it or whatever the case may yeah. be. Now, like, so not everybody is a heretic for the same reason. As mm. we well know pretty well at this point, if you listen to the episode, Marcion was also dubbed a heretic, but, you know, Marcion was also a dick. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't get that same, that, that necessary, that same fervor, that same, at least as you presented it, same aura from Tatian. Mm. This seems like somebody who was very thoughtfully trying to put together something that really flowed, that you could really latch on to. And it's an interesting idea because he he put all the four Gospels in there, correct? Yes, yeah. But also he chop, chopped up, up bits, duplicates, and contradictions. And then turned it into a single compilation. Mm. I think that's really interesting personally. Though I do totally understand why this would rankle people. And we were talking about this when we were talking about the in the episode who wrote the gospels why did they make four of them why didn't they make just one obviously a little further down the road we have the quran that's just the one pure simplicity that would seem like the thing to do but christianity obviously takes a very different route and all these four gospels are very different and so i have to imagine that if you are a christian of this period of time assuming you have access to all four of these that we now know as the canonized new testament version I would imagine they feel also something is lost in trying to turn it into this single flowing narrative because all of them add to a greater whole that wouldn't be this greater whole of potential theological understanding if you simply merge them and cut them and turn them into the single flowing narrative, despite some of the benefits that invariably are created by taking that approach. That's, that's one of the reasons I think it didn't stick around because there would be something missing with it. Even though it is sort of like the same story told four times, there is extra bits to it that people like to enjoy and know of, and people want that. And naturally, of course, it's difficult to compare it to the Quran, right? Because the Quran is supposed to have come directly from Muhammad, and that's very different than than, than the case of Christianity and Jesus, because Jesus didn't take anything down. You know, his, his disciples most certainly were not taking anything down. He was dictating directly to scribes, and you have just the one the, from the prophet that is the word. And Christianity is something else entirely, right? Yeah. There is a theory. Some, some scholars have theorized that the Quran is based on the dietetic. I said that's just theories. There's not, I'm not saying 100% complete. It's just a theory by some who think that the Quran may be based on it. I guess one of the strongest pieces of evidence points towards um, the Diatess one being so popular in Assyria, which has sort of gone on to be a Muslim part of the world in history and today. But that's just some theorizing and some basic speculation on my end. But it's interesting how you mentioned the Quran because it does parallel to the Diatess one. And when you hear that they were both, they're both single narratives, it does make you go, hmm, I wonder if that is the case. But I'm not 100% saying that's the case. It's just a theory some scholars have thrown out there. Does the Diatess one still exist? Yes and no. We don't have any complete manuscripts, like no complete manuscripts of a single copy of the Diatess one have been found, but extracts have been found in different languages. And through these extracts, and uh, once again, that's just to say how popular this was. It was published and printed. Well, print isn't the right word. It was written in multiple different languages because we found remains of it in those ways. And these have been translated into a single language and put together to create something of a completed form. And you can actually read it online for yourself. There'll be a link in this podcast where you can read the complete Diatessa on online. And I started reading it and yeah, it's it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just a clean, neat, singular retelling of the beginning, like of the Bible, of the Gospels. Now, naturally, the diatessaron, as he created it, is not what we have today. Though, no. like I said, despite the clear benefits that could have come from it. But he chooses the four. And we talked a little bit earlier about why that might have been. But what is its legacy today? So I don't think it has much of a legacy in Christianity because clearly we can see here like this for Gospels today. We, we, it tried, it had a good long run, a good like few hundred years of being it. But as I mentioned, it's theorized by some that its biggest legacy 
was left on Islam as opposed to Christianity with the Quran being a single um, story like the Diatessaron. It's believed that could possibly be its biggest legacy, but we aren't too sure about that. That's just free. But I think like, I think it has, I think a diatessaron of sorts has been left in somewhere. I mean, if you ask most people, like most people have a singular idea of Jesus's life in their mind. And like, that's just through hearing it through like through, taught in school. Paul, me and you both come from countries with, you know, what are mainly Christian and, and you get taught, taught this sort of stuff in school and you just at school, you are taught just this is how Jesus lived. You're not so much taught until you go to a bit of a higher level that there are gospels and that sort of thing unless you go to church yourself i think the concept of there being a singular narrative for christianity is somewhat in our minds we mo most of us most of us don't have conflicting ideas of the life of christian constantly in our brain we just think of one narrative of it all to, to, to use a term we all have built our own personal head canon yes exactly yes we all have our personal diatessaron i suppose yeah i suppose we do that's an interesting way of thinking about it Mm. As far as all of this goes, do you know how Tatian met his fate? He's believed to have died in 180 AD, so he died quite a bit, like not too shortly after his writings. How does this all sit in terms of historical significance now? Now that you're, we're getting more and more of the picture of how this New Testament came forward, what are some of your takeaways at the various striving towards something that's definitive in regards to a theologically definitive work that is and definitely is not a streamlined process. It seems to have a lot of different influences in terms of what we finally understand today. Where does this fit in all of that for you? I think what's so interesting about this, and to compare it with Marcion and his, uh, his New Testament of sorts from a few episodes back, I think what's so great about this is understanding things don't happen the first time round. There are, I don't know if mistakes is the correct word. I say missteps or different steps. We can all just presume Christianity is what it is and it always has been. And when we look at stuff like Tatian's Diatessaron and Marcion's attempt to, first attempt at a New Testament, we realize, no, that, that wasn't, it hasn't always been this way. There were alternate so i said i don't know if mistakes is the right word to use or just different approaches that didn't survive that led to what christianity is to this day it wasn't just this ready-made sort of religion good to go from the get-go it took missteps it went in weird directions before being canonized as you mentioned into what it is now yeah it's not one of those things where jesus dies and it appears ex nihilo right yeah no 100 percent, it's not that so th that that's interesting and of course so many other, what we now know today as definitive religious texts, do have a similar experience. You know, the the what we consider the Tanakh, the Old Testament, had many many different influences over an extended period of time in its creation. Right, when you can go back into Genesis and you could say, oh, they got this part from here and that part from there. And so this is not unfamiliar. And for me, at least, whether it be through historical perspective or just as Paul being Paul, it never ceases to amaze me the process that ensues when a greater group of devout people, all of which seem are seemingly well-intended, are trying to grasp and really rein in something that has touched them so deeply, so profoundly, so that they can communicate this to others in some sort of authoritative fashion. It's a very human process for something that is obviously dealing with concepts and, and beings that are in these scriptures that are so much bigger and so much more profound than our flesh and blood. And that when humans are faced with this, it is an extremely difficult, prolonged, and trying process finally get where it is they want to go, if they ever truly arrive at all, to that understanding in their eyes. And that's a great way to end it, Paul. Like, are we even there yet? Like, who's not to say that in the next 2,000 years, Christianity might look completely different? Maybe there'll be a new gospel added in another 2,000 years or something will change. Who knows? Like, was, was, I guess many might want to argue it's still being defined. Like, the religion is still being created.
Something that I always like to say when faced with something of this nature, we always consider the point we are in the present as the definitive, all-knowing, all-seeing time. Mm. But the truth of the matter is, that's what they thought a thousand years ago and 10,000 years before that. And if I've learned anything in this podcast or anything in life, don't write the history before history writes itself. Very good. Thank you, Paul. I hope you enjoyed uh, the Diatessaron. Oh, I wouldn't have missed it for all the tea in China, as the old <laughs> saying goes. And we'll be back right after a word from AD. This is the AD History Podcast. Well, that does it for us today. Patrick, where can people find us? You can find me personally, primarily on Instagram at NameExplainYT. But you can also find me on Twitter at NameExplainYT. And of course, on YouTube, search NameExplain. What about you, Paul? In addition to my usual work at TGNR at TGNReview.com, you can find me at my Twitter handle at PKD in history, as well as my reader submitted World War II Q&A column, The World War II Brain Bucket, where I answer all World War II related questions, which if you are on YouTube, we will have a link down in the description. That's all today for myself. Goodbye. Thank you. And take care. Yes. Thank you all so much. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at ADHistoryPC, as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash ADHistoryPodcast and Instagram as AD History Podcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. For Paul and Patrick, Thank you for listening to the AD History. We'll see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.